Welcome back to the Pearl Report. Over the years, 310,000 mainland spouses have settled in Taiwan. Since 2011, the government has been recruiting more mainland students and it's luring more tourists from across the strait as well. During the past six years of Ma ying presidency, cross-strait tension has eased. The hitherto anti-China Democratic Progressive Party says it's working towards a more flexible and pragmatic cross-strait policy. So what will come of these more intimate ties? In Taiwan, I can understand the news. For Hong Kong's mainstream news, I don't understand the Cantonese spoken on TV. And I can't read the words in dialect used by the newspapers. Roy Sun hails from Shanghai and speaks fluent Cantonese. He knows Hong Kong well because he attends the Chinese university here. Last September, he went to Taiwan as an exchange student. On this day, Roy and two students from Taiwan and Hong Kong organized the forum on their views of Hong Kong. He says compared with the acrimony between Hong Kongers and mainlanders, Taiwanese are more curious than hostile about mainland students. Most of my fellow students in Hong Kong feel the territory is strongly xenophobic. People here are more curious. Professors and students alike want to ask you questions on such matters as cross-strait ties and China's human rights. They love to hear your views. Since it opened up in 2011, Taiwan has over 3,500 mainland students studying for university degrees. They used to take up 1% of student recruitment. Last April, it was 2%. The new policy allows exchange students to study for bachelor's, master's or PhD degrees. Tai Bo Yi from Gansu province is in the first group of mainland students to go for a bachelor's degree at Taiwan's Tam Kang University. Taiwan's culture appeals to me because Taiwan's image is shaped like mysterious treasure island. For example, before I came to Taiwan, I never thought it would have such broad citizen participation in civil society. She witnessed the 2012 presidential election. I think relatively impressive was when Tsai Ling-wen lost and bowed and left the stage. There wasn't any blood and violence. But Tsai says she isn't interested in politics. She'd prefer to join social campaigns in Taiwan. On this day, she traveled from Tam Shui to Taipei's culture department to support a hunger strike to preserve an antiquity. We're fighting for it to be listed as a temporary heritage to avoid demolition. I feel Taiwan's civil society is energetic. Everyone has some tactics to combat faulty government policies. Joining a student organization, Tai met Taiwanese schoolmate Zhong Man Swan. Dong says Taiwanese really castigate people from the mainland. He only changed his view after meeting Tsai. I'm very much alive as an example. I used to say very offensive things about them. After I met Tsai Bo Yi, I changed my views, and I felt much better about China. What is special about her is although she's obviously a mainlander, she's immersed herself in social topics in Taiwan. I think that's very rare. In the past six years of Ma ying presidency, the government gradually opened up to mainland tourists. Besides tour groups, individual tourists reached 3,000 daily. In 2009, the time it took mainland spouses to get their ID cards was shortened from eight years to six years. Lu Yue Xiang married a Taiwanese in 1991 and settled in Taiwan with her husband the following year. She recalled she was a bit worried at the time. There were many cross-strait rumors about liberating Taiwan. If there really was a cross-strait conflict, wouldn't we Chinese bride become their hostages? 
，这个才种一株两株，这个种不够，你死掉一一两株了，你就后面就没有了。Now she commutes between Taiwan and her business in her hometown of Xiamen. In 2010, she founded the Chinese Production Party and became its chairman. It claims to have 30,000 members. The party flag has five stars against a blue background. It represents us mainland women who married Taiwanese spouses. Our group grew up under the red flag. Now we are in Taiwan and belong to the Pan Blue Camp. We support cross-strait peace. Before forming her political party, Liu twice led groups to canvass votes for the Kuomintang in presidential elections. Party member Jiang Jinlian was also active in those campaigns. Jiang Jinlian married an ex kuomintang soldier in 1996, but the man was even older than her own mother. So her father opposed the marriage, fearing it may affect the family. Since my brother is working in a lab researching parasites, he worried I may affect my brother's career. <laughs> Jiang later joined the Kuomintang as well as the Chinese Production Party. I joined the Production Party because it gives us a voice. We must be united. We need a leader who fights for our status in Taiwan. Last year, mainland newspaper reported the Kuomintang offered the Chinese Production Party a legislative seat if its members joined the Kuomintang. This aroused controversy in the society. Chairwoman Lu Yuexiang denied the report. She admits her party wants to be in the legislature, but also acknowledges it's a sensitive issue in Taiwan. In Taiwan's political arena, mainland brides are regarded as very ambitious and eager to enter politics. It's as if someone from the Communist Party was infiltrating the legislative yuan. In terms of political rights, mainland spouses have the right to vote once they obtain a Taiwan ID card. They can work for the government after 10 years. The Democratic Progressive Party has said it advocated relaxed policies on livelihood, but strict ones on identity requirements. Inside Taiwan, people have disparate suspicions about mainland China's threat. But it's not fair to blame it on mainland spouses or mainland students, which I'll talk about later. Actually, though, is it fair for Taiwan to be the target of 2,000 missiles? In 2010, Democratic Progressive Party legislators fought with Kuomintang lawmakers to oppose recruiting more mainland students to Taiwan. Within the parameters of opening up to mainland students, we required more restrictions on them, including many conditions listed by our parliament. In the end, restrictions and bans on mainland students included a quota on enrollment, taking jobs while studying, and getting nationwide insurance coverage accorded to their foreign and compatriot counterparts so they could enjoy cheap medical services. I want to see what the mainland can learn from Taiwan's development. Wang Chun comes from Shandong and is among the first group of mainland students coming to Taiwan to get a PhD. He attends National Taiwan University. He said initially he felt Democratic Progressive Party's animosity. Many politicians might say this person came to Taiwan to steal information. Another might say after this person comes to work here, Taiwanese would lose job opportunities. He said the mainland authorities required them to go to a presentation on Taiwan prior to going there. They talked about limitations in Taiwan, such as not joining too many political campaigns, because they are also very worried mainland students in Taiwan might be tricked by political figures or forces. Wang, a political science major, joined a two-day exchange camp organized by the Democratic Progressive Party last December. Now, in his third year in Taiwan, Wang says he feels the DPP's hostility has eased. After mainland students actually arrived in Taiwan, they started to contact us and probably the hostility is gradually dissipating. Two years ago, the DPP revived its China Affairs Department. 
There's many reasons for the revival, but the important thing I want to say is too many things involve mainland China. Whether we like the changes in China or not, we need to know more about them. Taiwan analysts say the Democratic Progressive Party had to rethink its China policy after losing in the last presidential election. Hong Zai Lung says the DPP now has to be more practical in handling cross strait ties. Our policy is becoming more flexible. We really aren't staunchly anti China. But we remain cautious about it, especially the Beijing authorities. But for mainland people and society, we basically welcome them. The end of this year will see the so-called seven-in-one election. The contest in Taipei will attract the most attention. Analysts say the Democratic Progressive Party lost in the last presidential race due to its handling of mainland issues. The coming polls would test whether the DPP's toned-down China policy appeals to voters. Well, thank you for watching our show. It will be re-aired on Tuesday and Saturday, as well as on TVB.com. Until next time, from the Pearl Report team, good night, good luck, good health, and have a happy and prosperous year of the horse. Thank <laughs> you.